Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benulli. I am the CEO of Cedar Gold, and today we have a very special podcast discussion with very special guests. The podcast will focus on sustainability in sports, what that means, how and what we can do to reach sustainability in that regard. We will discuss examples from different areas of sports. Um, and also, as for my example, I can say I, I can highlight uh, whitewater rafting. I just did whitewater rafting yet here in, uh, in Canada near Ottawa. I can say it has many elements of sustainability of the environment, including water resources, timber resources, healthy lifestyle. So let, let's uh, look at uh, exploring other examples here in this podcast. And now here's our senior advisor to, C to Cedar Gold, Alejandro Tagliavini. Hi, hi everybody. I'm here in Buenos Aires right now. Today we have uh, Princess Leona von Liechtenstein from Green Team Team. She's in Milan right now. We have uh, Fred Malich, who is the best polo player in Canadian history. I can't think about any sport more green, uh, more uh, more friendly to, to the green than polo. It's very, very green. We have Archduke Ferdinand Asper. He's a race, a racing driver, and he's involved in this very interesting uh, green future project. And we have Alvaro de Marichalar, who is a sportman and has a very fast experience in the ocean, saving the oceans and, uh, and keeping the oceans green and clean. Alvaro, can you begin to telling us about your experience with the oceans and keep them clean and green? Alvaro? For sure. For sure, Alejandro. Well, well thank you very much for organizing this uh, summit. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. I mean, it's very important to to organize these kind of meetings and uh, promote uh, sustainability through sports and through a lot of activities uh, that um, uh, we sportsmen we we try to do mainly to educate because the main the main thing here is to to educate to let people know uh, what's going on in the world to show the world to the world as it is. And for that, sports and exploration is very important. Um, we are doing for the past 40 years, we are trying to show the ocean to the people um, through expeditions, uh, um, carrying up, up, I mean, doing with uh, very, very small vessels, the size of a dolphin, very, very small, three meters length vessels, um, a water scooter is called. So I can see a lot and I can film everything I see. And then I can give a lot of uh, lectures and write books and produce documentaries in order to show what's going on for sure in the world, especially illegal fishing, oil spilling and plastic dumping in the ocean. As you know, in a few years, the weight of plastic will be higher than the weight of all fish in the ocean. If we continue on dumping plastic nonstop to the ocean, using our oceans and seas and rivers and lakes as garbage places. So we, leave, we need to, to educate, we need to, co to bring conscience to people, awareness, and for that um, sports is key because people, they are very curious about sportsmen and the explorers, and um, our responsibility is high on this end. So it's not a, an option, I think. We, we, we love our planet, as we do, all of us. We need to protect it, and for that, we need to educate in order to respect it. It's all we can do, but we can do it, and we should do it. Well, great, thank you. Uh, are you living you are you living us right now or staying some a few minutes more? I don't know. Unfortunately, um, there is a hundred people here waiting for me in a lecture I need to, to give. Okay. 
Yeah, we are well. I mean, abs actually about these things. So, uh, congratulations again for all what you're doing, and uh, I hope to have the honor to to join you and um, come in uh, next time. And thank you, thank you very, very much for inviting. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, thank you. We're having okay. See you later. Uh, Ferdinand, tell us. Uh, Ferdinand is coming. Is a uh, racing car driver, and he's come just uh, won the Le Mans. Uh, that's a great achievement for such a young driver, and he's very, very much involved in the future, in the Green Future Project. Tell us about this future, this project, Green Future Project, Ferdinand. Can I listen to you? Uh, you're yeah, I'm not very professional yet, okay. but I'm back now. Um, All right. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you so much for having me again. Uh, the last conversation was so nice. I learned a lot myself, especially from Alvaro. And uh, so it's an honor to be on again. Um, yeah, I won, just won Le Mans, which is uh, one of the three biggest races you can win as a racing driver. So it means a lot right. um, Yeah, for my career. That's a, something that I've been doing since I'm um, seven years old. So it's been a while now. Um, and um, well, the, you spoke about it. The Green Future Project is, a, is an organization um, based in Italy. Uh, organized by a bunch of young people that I got to meet uh, at the beginning of this year. And um, essentially uh, how I got to meet them was by uh, my idea that seeing that everybody else and all other industries are becoming more and more um, focused on making their practices more sustainable, uh, greener. Um, and uh, and I just kind of felt a bit bad, to be honest, because motorsport, obviously, you would not connect with anything related to anything green, except for electric racing, maybe. But uh, for me, motorsport has been my life. It's kind of also a, an image of innovation and forward thinking and uh, has always been sort of the testing grounds for anything road related. And uh, I thought that the sport could use somebody uh, young, somebody uh, up and coming in the motorsport world that maybe has an influence on how motorsport is performed and i just kind of started doing a bunch of research and trying to find out where the damage is done in a in a sporting event like a race and uh, i very quickly found out that like in most industries i think it's not where you think it would be the the racing cars themselves create a very very small proportion of the damage that is created it's a lot of behind the scenes movement which is super bad like all the trucks all the transportation all the flights all of our waste and plastic and just like what albert was speaking about and i thought um if we can find a way in motorsport to reduce our impact on the environment um as much as possible or drastically and of course also uh, begin the practice of carbon offsetting so through sponsorship and and through uh, fundraising um protect uh, endangered forests in the Amazon. Uh, we've been able to protect um, over 100 acres of endangered forest in Ecuador in the Rupa Reserve up until this point. It's only been going for a couple of months, but I feel like that's quite a cool achievement. We've been able to offset um, over half of the grid that I'm racing in by the project that I started, which is awesome. And, um, you know, do simple things that everybody should be doing anyways, but just haven't been implemented in these sort of old school industries um, like eradicating single-use plastics, recycling, um, setting up recycling bins at racetracks. And it includes just everything, talking to tire manufacturers, oil manufacturers, um, uh, racetracks, and all these sort of things that are um, important places in some way for many people because they're such big fans. And, and like Alvaro was also speaking about sport being such a key element to get uh, galvanizing people, galvanizing energies and getting people together and being an ambassador for something positive. So hopefully, uh, yeah, my project has done that in some way or is planning on doing that. I have a, my racing car is completely carbon neutral. All of my racing has been carbon offset. And I've been even able to um, um, put the branding on the racing car, an image of the forest that it's protecting by going around. So I feel like that's a sort of very controversial image, but yet something that could be strong, something that seems damaging, but is uh, doing its utmost and kind of working towards sustainability was what it means it should be long lasting it doesn't mean eradication it means long lasting forward thinking i think everybody oh, wait, knows wait. that anyways i don't need to say that but there's just the 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 idea of the project oh great 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 by the way where are you other than 
Where are you? Uh, are you I'm in Vienna. I live here. Oh, oh yeah. My right. apartment. Well, this is very international. I, I'm in Buenos Aires, you in Vienna. Teora uh, in Milan. Alvaro was in Madrid. Richard is in Ottawa, Canada. And Fred, where are you? <laughs> okay. I'm sitting here in uh, Eaglesham, Alberta. So think Northern Canada. <laughs> and uh, well, Ferdinand, well done with all your success. I know Le Mans, uh, you know, not as well as you, of course, but that is quite the achievement. So I'm well done with obviously your efforts uh, aimed at sustainability and around the ESG movement. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, I can't think in, in another sport more, more green friendly than Polo. I mean, fields are so green. Uh, uh, everything is so green around Polo, you know, and, uh, and you are also, you're not also the best Polo player in Canadian history, but you are the uh, great patron. You you are the patron of a team that um, got to be the second, the world's second best polo team, and you are also a breather. So you breed the horses, which is uh, very um, very friendly to the team, to the animals and to the green. Tell us about you, uh, a little bit about your breeding activities. What did you begin breeding? How did you begin breeding? And how much are you breeding now? Yeah, so it was really born out of our families been playing polo for a long time here in North America. And my dad had a operation in Canada. And what we realized when I started playing at the highest level is that all the best breeders are in Argentina because they have access to uh, the best trainers in the world. Uh, the feedstock uh, prices for like you know shoes and hay and veterinarian and labor is cheap there and because we do this on an industrious uh, manner we breed about like 60 horses a year all these things start adding up around the efficiencies of you know using great bloodlines with people that know what they're doing and obviously in a land that if you plant the seed and a little bit of sun and water it'll grow so uh, it's an ideal location for breeding horses and you know around the, the sustainability aspect um, you know, we are aware that uh, if we can utilize the, the farm in a more uh, economical and sustainable manner, then we don't have to go to outside providers for uh, like, for example, just basic things like food and hay and um, materials like that. I think probably what I actually have more to add to the discussion is yesterday was a historic day uh, for the investment community. I have an investment management company and we launched the first carbon negative fund in the world. It trades on the TSX. And it the way we're able to do that is for every million in AUM, assets under management, if we plant 3,450 trees and we sequester 1,000 tons of CO2 a year. And so it's about 60 times carbon negative compared to the uh, underlying assets that we own, we own. And the underlying assets are Bitcoin futures. But we don't actually mine it. And I think this is going to be one of these watershed moments in the investment management community where you're going to see a lot of people do the exact same thing because it's a very repeatable process. And we know that uh, we wanted to play in a, a sphere where the ESG uh, movement becomes more and more important for investors. And we also think that you know crypto space will be met with investor enthusiasm. So that's probably my little piece on how I'm interacting uh, you know, in the global community that we all live in today. Oh, great, great. And Theora, she's uh, the um, founder of Green Team Team, which is an a, a, a NGO dedicated to the young people to learn and, and work on, on sustainability. And she's also a polo player, aren't you, Theora? I'm mostly a dressage rider, actually but I hope to play polo once I go to university. So yeah, I I'm very intrigued to have Fred here on the discussion as well. I'm very excited. Well, you're invited to Argentina. Let's go to Alegria and play. And for those who don't speak Spanish, <laughs> Alegria means happiness in Spanish. And I'm sure we would have happy days there. So gates are open. Let's make it happen. I'd absolutely love that. I'd be honored. Right. Any questions, Theora, to the... Well, Ferdinand, any which, anything you want to say? Um, yes, so I have like more questions for Fred, if that's okay. Um, especially when it comes to 
how you were talking about in your investments fund, you're not actually mining the Bitcoin because that also, from what I've understood, consumes a lot of energy and that's probably how it has more of a carbon footprint on our world. So what exactly are you offsetting when you have done your like negative fund? Yeah, exactly. So what we do is we trade futures contracts so like any commodity it trades as uh, futures contracts on the cme board in the north american stock exchanges and this is a much less carbon intensive way to own the underlying asset of bitcoin and we offset any uh, carbon emissions that we generate by planting those 3450 trees for every million dollars in assets under management and we do that through a third party tree planting firm it's called 10 tree and we partner with them because there's a company out of california where for every uh, $10 in merchandise that you buy from them, they plant a tree. And they are in a very competitive uh, marketplace and they've seen tremendous success with that type of program. So we plant uh, mangrove trees in Madagascar through their true planting program. And we plant mangrove trees because it's the tree that's able to sequester as much carbon as quickly as possible because they grow very quickly and um, are able to do it on a very efficient basis. So that's the the mechanism that we're using to sequester the carbon to offset any emissions that we're generating through the underlying asset of Bitcoin futures. Oh, that's incredible. That's and um, I actually came up with a question with Fafad and and I was wondering, um, since you've started this project, do you think that any other teams in the motorsport industry or any other like areas of motorsport industry are also looking to do similar things by carbon neutralizing? Uh, part of the sport. Yeah. Well, you see a lot. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Um, and Fred, I must say, I have no idea about investment banking, but it all sounds very interesting. And, and I'd like to know more about that as well. Uh, all those letters and acronyms that couldn't really put anything in together. But anyways, um, to your question, um, obviously, there's other projects that are already doing that, that are sort of higher up, especially bigger manufacturers. The typical one is Mercedes. It's a huge company. So they are kind of, let's say, uh, socially bound to try to do something to be able to sell more cars. And um, I see it as something positive in a way, you know, whatever you need to do to justify to become more green or be become more sustainable is something good, good for us. Um, and uh, my approach when I started the project was for my own racing. So all of my racing this year was my goal was to offset all of it, do all the maths or, or have green future project, do all the, calculation on what my footprint actually is um, and uh, I then took all of that information put it in a portfolio and sent it to all the other teams that I was competing with and saying like look I, I started this it's really simple this is our footprint on approximate basis obviously based on our numbers uh, it'll be a bit different depending on where the workshop is and how they operate but in principle it'll stay within about uh, 102 metric tons of CO2 annually uh, produced and CO2 so um, I was like, this is this is what we're doing. Um, maybe you'd quite be interested to do it. And I ended up me having meetings with a bunch of them. So I now uh, am supporting four different teams with their environmental projects. And actually the team that I'm racing with, which took this on board uh, to the highest level, which is really cool, is called WRT. It's a, the team that I won Le Mans with. We, on the same weekend, uh, won uh, the, in, in our championship, the organizers are called the ACO. There's an acronym for you, Fred. Um, that uh, they basically host an award that every team needs to provide the information that you do to become more sustainable as a manufacturer or a team. And my team won that award thanks to the project uh, Drive Fast, Act Fast. So that was really cool. That was great to, to win that, uh, to prove that my project is efficient, let's say, and also that the team at the same time won Le Mans. So it's kind of like a picture of like, we can be carbon neutral. We can do all of these things to change our logistics and our simple things that actually I wasn't trying to change the whole wheel, but just try to do basics um, that they were not doing it and carbon neutralizing and still be able to win the biggest race that you can win in the year. So uh, let's say I definitely tried to, to ride that one out as long as possible and present it to more manufacturers. So the goal is to have a whole uh, petrol fuel racing championship that is carbon neutral and, and kind of innovates the, the future of, of that in a way, try to make the sport a sustainable sport is that the, the sort of mistake that people do is like, oh, if you want to go racing, you should put batteries in the car. But the problem with batteries, I think, is sort of 
quite it's, it's, it's got its own place and it's super important to develop that technology but at the same time the the, the car is not in in reality the issue it's where everything before comes it's the tire manufacturer it's the oil manufacturer it's the teams transporting and creating the cars it's like that's the whole and i think in most industries like i said it's it's the background which is damaging but unfortunately it's not so sexy to to sort of sell that to them and try to change the background because you can't sell it you put a battery in the car it's good advertising and that's what they're going for but that's not what i'm trying to do i'm trying to not change the superficialness of like i'm trying to sell a car but i'm trying to change the the things that are actually creating 85 percent of the issue and i think that's kind of the, the hard thing in in sort of our in our world where it's all about selling things and, and making money which it totally makes sense you know obviously um but you sometimes also need sort of projects like these and, and obviously your um your campaign are these kind of things where we're trying to do the things that nobody really wants to do because it doesn't look that sexy so uh that's sort of the, the approach i guess okay freddy tell us about your team the alegria your follow team What are your yeah, plans so the for team, the future? Yeah. We have an amazing season lined up in Argentina. Uh, so we're playing right. the Argentine Triple Crown. Uh, we're one of the right. eight best teams in the world. And we play Tortugas, which starts October 5th, then Hurlingham. And then we move on to the pinnacle of the sport, the Argentine Open, which is played in downtown Buenos Aires from mid-November to mid-December. And uh, Alegria has a beautiful story behind it. Um, you know, it really came out of nowhere. And in 2013, we reached the finals, uh, the Argentine Open. And that year, we changed our colors to our sponsor colors that happened to be pink, Rosa. And we had a right. tremendous reaction with the fans. And we've kept the uh, Rosa colors uh, flying high and bright. And so often when you see an image of a polo player, uh, if you see a Rosa colored jersey, it uh, most likely is the Alegria polo team jersey. So we really distinguished ourselves. And, and Ferdinand, when you talked about putting the livery on the car uh, that was distinctive in nature to really celebrate the efforts that you have uh, around your sustainability drive, uh, that resonates well with me. And I, I imagine it must resonate well with you know, your fan base and your supporters as well, because imagery and colors uh, related to what you're doing obviously have a lasting impression. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was something that really resonated also. What was quite important was the sponsors, because uh, because of that, we were able to attract more companies that were willing to sponsor more money that ended up going towards the trees, which was so cool. And also something that is a good selling point to teams is like, if you apply these sustainability processes to your team, you're more likely to get more money as well, which is something that is a, is a pitch, you know, because in reality, when I was going with my uh, campaign, I was asking for a donation is the reality of it. It's like, I, I want to go and protect this reserve, Narupa Reserve in Ecuador. I want to take you there. I want, I want you to visit it. It's a beautiful place. It's incredible. Uh, but I want some money as well um, for to do the offsetting of your racing team. And nobody really wants to spend money on trees in motorsports. So I needed to be like, listen, if you do this, you take part of this campaign, you put the drive fast, act faster on your car. It's all online. Everybody can find out what it is. And you can tell your sponsors, listen, we're, We're, we're doing um we're racing carbon neutral here is this more interesting to you and then companies don't want to sponsor something motorsport related but they want to sponsor something that might be an image for forward thinking sustainability stuff like that so that helped a lot and what was really cool is that i uh, i insisted on the team because they every year make new clothing you know with sponsors and you've got to make you know this i mean every year you have a new sponsor you need to make a new clothing for everybody so it's like a thousand pieces of clothing and i was like why don't we use a provider that doesn't cost much more any anymore really that uh, uses upcycled plastics in their clothing and it was just such small things that ended up making the sponsor be like oh that's really cool you know i want to i want to buy that i want to buy that t-shirt because it it took plastic out of the out of the, to the mediterranean from fishermen that collected it and we turned it into into merchandise and sold that online and it just kind of created the cycle of like being able to raise more and more money and it kind of got super exciting for me as you can tell uh but uh i i it's also something that you know gets dry and you need to keep your mind sharp on this kind of stuff as you guys know Ferdinand, really? you said something there. I would like to know the slogan. You said racing fast, but changing it's, faster. It's drive fast, act faster, and which is perfect right. because we won Le Mans with the thing. So it was like, I don't want racing to stop. I don't want you guys to, to just think that I'm trying to stop something that you guys love and that has this huge power and, and, and uh, um, possibility to connect people. 
uh, I, I want you guys to continue giving everything and, and winning races. Well, not, not against me, obviously, but in general, um, but also to act faster. Think about it. Think about what we're doing. I mean, when you, what was really pissing me off, sorry, I shouldn't say that, what was really uh, annoying me was leaving a racetrack over the last, you know, eight years and seeing that all of the rubbish that teams use, I mean, because stickers and so much plastic and waste gets created at a rate, like any event, really, any event where you have 100,000 people, there's huge amounts of waste. And uh, it's just like, where's this going? And I once followed it. I stayed the day after the race and I saw it just all went in one trash, went in one place, no recycling. I was like, what are we doing here? This is ridiculous. I can't believe it. So I, I spoke to all the racetracks. I was like insisting that they need to use recycling bins. And I'm in talks with the organizers to only go to racetracks that, that have recycling processes in, um, in place because some of them still don't. And I'm shocked, you know, it's outrageous but so many cool things that came out of it like i found a clothing manufacturer who could uh, offer to take all of the waste from an event like le mans take all that plastic waste from people coming and viewing itself and, and turning that plastic waste into le mans merchandise so it's just kind of trying to make that sort of whole thing work well yeah drive fast act faster is the slogan amazing slogan really? that was smart because you can brand everything to it and people can remember it quickly and and uh you know, I just typed it into Google and it's the number one thing that came up. So well done. Sweet. That's good Great. to know. Thanks. Now, Fiora, can you tell us a bit about the Green Team team, please? Um, yeah, happily. So um, I founded Green Team team in 2014 when I was nine. And um, I was really lucky that I grew up in nature and I always had the luxury of being able to go into the forest and like really understanding my local biodiversity and treasuring it, which is something that once I started going to school, I realized not everyone had that same understanding for or the same connection to, which I found extremely sad. So um, I had this incredible opportunity when I was um, approached by the zoo close to where I grew up in Verona. Um, that wanted to do some sort of collaboration with me and start a project. And so we looked at all of the endangered species in, in Italy in particular, which is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. And uh, we found out that there are these six species of turtles and tortoises that are actually uh, nearly completely extinct or endangered. And as these are animals that you could actually like connect with in some sort of way that I could bring my classmates in and they could touch and they could understand more about them. I thought it was a perfect way to start off our project. And so our first project encapsulates um, our, our message which is trying to bring local communities closer to their local biodiversity, because it's all good, it's all good and well to um, give off some donations to help lions in Africa or to plant trees in the Amazon or so on. But we also have endangered species and a lot of work that can be done at our doorstep. So we work all over the world with lots of different um, communities, for example, in Madagascar, Zimbabwe, the Maldives, uh, in North America. So it's really exciting and um that's the gist of my project great great um Ferdinand, what are your next races you're we're going to be involved in um my next race will be in belgium in spa at the european championship and um i have four more races this year and uh, doing some other jobs on the side. But uh, hopefully one of them will be to go and visit the turtles in Italy that the Theodora is protecting. I think that sounds, that sounds awesome. I think that um, it's so, I think what you were saying is cool because it's, it's so tempting to just try to fix something far away or, or, or you know, something, something super attractive sounding like, um, you know, the Amazon rainforest and uh, whereas She's totally right. Sometimes to find adventure or something that's important to do, you don't have to go further than outside your doorstep, really. So I think that imagery is cool. You don't have to go far. Like for me, it's a five hour drive to go into Italy or less most of the time. And um, it's just the same. Like, actually, I don't even need to do that. I need to make sure that everybody in my building is recycling and, and doing their small parts. So I think that's that's an important thing that uh, Theodora was saying there for sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, I've also had that. Sorry? You're more than welcome to come visit Wait. us whenever you want to. And we have projects a bit everywhere. We also do summer camps 
uh, where we invite people from all over the world because we have members um, to really like to discuss the issues at hand and to try and get in as many backgrounds as possible into these discussions because it's very interesting that everyone from different cultures and from different ages have different ideas that we all need to listen to and that can really create a diverse and different outlook on how we can make a better future and as you said all like the small like changes you can make are the best and they all add up so just turning off the light recycling <laughs> like using less water it genuinely makes a difference and yeah yeah great um alejandro what are you doing are you recycling are you being good <laughs> let's, no, let's ask the main man here yeah, I do. <laughs> You're far away. Yeah. We're in Argentina, by the way. We have a lot of countryside here, and uh, we are small population for the size of the country. You know, we are only 45 million people for a country which is uh, one third of the United States. It's like, a, like a Spain, France, Germany, Belgium. Switzerland, Italy, all together, and we are only 45 million people, so we have a lot of... Uh, well, you, Theodora, you've been in Argentina, haven't you? Um, yes, I visited Argentina a long time yeah. ago, when I was like seven, yeah, and it was amazing. To, yeah, I've been to like, the Esteros de Libera, which is very um, an amazing place, what, uh, yeah. with a lot of... Uh, and we have the Patagonia, which is almost... Uh, almost desert out of the Patagonia and it's a, we have a lot of we are very much country country so we have a lot of countryside and we are very much fond of the, of the country you know we walk to the country a lot and we do a lot of country life so yeah. Fred knows a lot in Argentina too he's got this his club here um when are you coming to Buenos Aires Fred by the way I'm coming on Monday and uh, so right. bringing everyone down, getting ready for the season. Our first game is October 5th. So training for that and getting ready. Uh, but Ferdinand, I, can you describe in detail what it's like to go up uh, the hill at Spa? Because that's one of those iconic uh, tracks in the world. And that's also an iconic corner. And you're doing it at the highest level. I think that would be really cool. Uh, and, and maybe how you can you know, relate it into what you're doing at the Spa track around, um, obviously, your conservation efforts. That would be That'd be awesome to hear. I'd be curious to know. I mean, to be honest, when I'm racing myself, I part of the slogan is to still drive fast, you know. So my whole focus is just that in reality and trying to get up the hill flat out um, because it's not as easy as it looks on TV. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, from the driving perspective, it's 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 absolutely mad. It's you're getting there at like 280 kilometers an hour, and um, the car goes steep uphill, so you have a lot of compression. And then as you go over the hill, you lose all your weight in a way and the car gets loose. So it, it's quite a quite a cool corner, but let's say it's 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 butchy clenching for sure. And uh, it's especially if you're doing a long, long race. So we have, you know, four hours, six hours, eight hours and 24 hour races there. Um, when you do a 24 hour race there, it's like every single lap. You need to like hold your breath as you go through because and I, I did my first 24 hour race there last year. And I was completely unprepared because it was a last minute call up um, because of COVID. So many drivers, you know, someone would catch COVID. So you jump in quickly and it was like this whole charades game. And I was called in last minute for this race because someone, someone got COVID. And uh, I arrived completely unprepared. And, and it was just like every lap in that race. I was like, at, uh, when I got over it, I was like, why, why am I doing this? This is crazy. This is way too dangerous. But um, in the end, you just have such a endorphin rush and um, adrenaline rush that you just it, it, you, your eyes are like this for 24 hours so it's very very cool um and yeah they, i was there just last weekend and they've been having horrible issues with um uh flooding um what? huge floods have been going on in belgium and in germany actually wow. destroying uh towns and cities and uh there was even cases where they had a dam set up like a dam system and it was so overloaded that it just crushed through and um people actually uh, died from that just in europe like something you just never would believe that people were dying from flooding you know and uh it's it that that, that makes you think like they had to this is really strange they had to like repatch parts of the track because it was damaged from all the rain and it's like wow so we, we're doing all this and 
we still need to keep on fighting to get people to become aware and not just walk over it or build a bridge, you know, like um, looking at the root of it. And I think the huge conversation at the moment is all the fires going on. And um, it's one of those things that's super tricky. I find actually this is a good place to bring it up. It's like, and it's something Theodora touched on as well. It's like, it's, you know, this whole posting on Instagram, um, donate to this, do this. Um, I'm, I, I always kind of put it in question because it's like, it does relieve you of the, um, it gives you some sort of relief of responsibility if you do a post, because it's like, I've done my part because I've posted something. And uh, it's, I don't know, I want to know, know what you guys think about it, because I often question um, well, I don't, I hate to question people's intentions because they, they, I always believe people are doing the, the right thing, but, uh, I always try to find out what was the thing that people you can actually do that you won't post on Instagram, because I really, really want to actually do something rather than just be part be a sheep. You know what I mean? Like maybe I can really? get your thoughts on that instead of me just calling everybody a sheep, I guess. I feel a bit bad. No, I, I completely agree with you that often people will just post on Instagram or they just do things. I'd say basically to show off that they're actually activists. Um, a big something that stuck with me is when there were all the protests here, like striking school for the environment. I remember that I'd then walk where the same streets or the same piazzas where they'd actually strike and there was just litter everywhere, plastic bottles like everywhere. And that shocked me because these were supposedly people that actually cared for the environment, that actually wanted to make some sort of difference, but at the same time weren't helping in any productive way they were just complaining um so that's why i think that initiatives such as yours are so important because you're actually doing something rather than just raising awareness which is incredible and so important like no way to deny that it's even more important to actually take action and however small your like action is it's still so valuable and so important so yeah well, talking about driving fast, you know, I'm a self I'm a, a, play, a polo player, not as much as Fred, not as, not as much as Fred, but one of the things I, I love the most of polo was is driving so fast on the horse, you know, it's a, a lot of adrenaline driving fast on the horse, and uh, that's pretty dangerous too. Is that right, uh, Fred? I mean, but how well, far, I think, how, yeah. I think it's how a matter does, of... Uh... You know, horses have like a top speed, probably like, you know, what's permissible with like a race car. And so yeah. actually it's what allows you to get to top speed quicker than everyone else, which is actually what your competitive advantage is. So I don't know if it's similar to racing. I imagine it would be. And horses are very unique uh, in one way because they're all built a little bit different. They all have, you know, different characteristics tied to them. And uh, I imagine it's also the same in the racing, but at the highest level, at the top level with, you know, the top class players, it's actually quite safe because everyone needs, knows what they're doing. They're able to actually uh, ride the horses and maneuver amongst the players and the play in a very logical and, and safe manner. Of course, accidents happen right. just like in anything, but at the highest level uh, with the top horses and the top fields and the top players, it's, um, I believe to be safer because uh, you take out a lot of randomness, uh, they can happen with, you know, inexperienced players or maybe horses that are not as athletic or of as much quality. Right. Great. We'll have to get Theodora and, down to Argentina so she can have a look, uh, start mm -hmm. her out on the polo horse right at the, the basic level, just, you know, really easy and safe. And uh, you'll see that, um, you know, people generally overestimate their riding abilities. And that's not a great combination when you have like an animal involved as well. I and you know that, you know that from dressage, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so I've also played polo a few times. Definitely not very well. Hand-eye coordination needs to be worked on, but um, it's so much fun. And the adrenaline you get from it and galloping the horses is basically um, and cornering so quickly. But yes, uh, absolutely same thing. Like dressage is extremely safe sport. Um, and like if you have experienced people, but... Um, a lot comes into question when people don't understand the animal that they're working with or um, the entire situation, which I think is a big difference in between like motorsport and actually like polo or dressage is that you're working with a machine rather than with another being, which is uh, an interesting dynamic. It's way safer. It's way safer. 
<laughs> an animal has its own mind. It can do what it wants. A racing car is just a machine. Uh, I, although I still call it my girl, it's like it's still it's I, she does what I need it to do. But um, yeah, I get the only danger is when I make a mistake, which then I can take on board, no problem. Uh, or when something actually breaks, which is very rarely. Because fortunately, just like you said, when you get to a certain level, you you work with such incredible people that you are just like okay well you, you might be changing a brick a set of brakes in three minutes but i still have full faith when i get to the end of the straight at 380 kilometers an hour that when i hit the pedal it's going to stop so um yeah and that on that end i i also kind of believe that sports there's an element to it that the element of risk plays into the attractiveness of it you know so sure. and if, if we're completely safe you know you might as well have robots racing and nobody's right. going to watch you're them. right um, so yeah. and, and the element of a risky part of the job is is uh, to me what makes it unique the 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 capability to judge your your talents uh, to the to the situation that you're in is is the skill you know like I, I I could teach you Theodora or Fred I could teach you how to drive a racing car in a day I mean I could teach you the the principles of it I could get you guys going around a lap you know really no big deal but getting to that sort of you know, when it comes to like hundreds and tenths and 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 very 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 small margins, that's when it's it's like you have to start taking risks to get there, and that's the the skill, I guess. When did you play polo, Viola? By the way. Um. So first, when I went to Argentina, when I was very small, oh, right. and then um, I a few times when I went to South Africa. Um. Oh, right. Yeah. Where in Argentina? Do you remember? Um. No, I can't remember the exact hacienda that I went to. Sorry, <laughs> I was in right. seven. Oh, no, 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 no. Fred, you know, there's some people believe that um, uh, horses suffer the young polo playing polo, you know, because they are too much, uh, um, too much running and whatever. Well, some people believe that horses uh, suffer playing polo, but that's not true. On the, I believe, on the contrary, horses are benefited. With polo because they are very well kept and very well uh, breathe. And what do you think about it? Tell I us. completely agree, Alejandro. I mean, right. these animals uh, have a mind of their own, and they go through you know, five years of training. To basically, from the age of two to seven, they're just going through training to finally make it to the actual competition. And so, horses will self-select themselves out if they don't want to do it. I mean, they have their own mind, they're their own being. And uh, you can sense uh, through little actions of their ears or their behavior or the energy that they display, whether they want to participate in the activities being asked of them or not. And they're much bigger than us. So if they wanted to buck you off, they can. I mean, or they could, you know, flip over. I mean, things happen where a well-trained horse will you know, have some sort of seizure or something that's completely out of, you know, even their control because of, uh, you know, they're just a being as they are. But I think that the horses uh, quite enjoy it. They're pack animals as well. So you'll often see horses standing together in the same field or when one goes to water, they all go to water. And so being in that community of the barn, I mean, they get the sense that, you know, it's game day. We're all going to the field together in the truck and trailer and then off they go. And on the field, even though they're all like kind of competing horses, as we, as we would call it, they're all playing the game together. So I see it uh, as if they didn't want to do it, they would very quickly self-select themselves out and they receive excellent treatment. I mean, uh, they get fed twice a day. They have water there all the time. They get, you know, people hand cleaning them day in, day out. Uh, you know, these are expensive assets to purchase and to maintain. And so people are going to look after them in a very logical and methodical manner. Yeah, right. You know, there is a uh, there is an irony with the with animals. You know, here in Argentina we have a lot of cattle, and um, people. Oh, well, we finally eat the cattle, so we kill the cattle to because to, to eat them. But at the same time, you know, cows were, would have disappeared if it was not because of the breeding of the cattle. I mean, this is like an irony, you know. In Argentina, as I say, we have a lot a lot of, of cattle because. We finally eat them or, or use the milk, but but the truth is that cattle cows cows would not exist anymore if it were breathed by the by the by the in the countryside. I know it's kind of it's an irony. I can I cannot 
and to solve. I don't know what on the end of this is here. Anyway, uh, what are well, you, I, I can what, promise what's... you I'm doing. I can promise you I'm doing my part to make sure that we're producing good horses for the polo players of the world, and uh -huh. we're having a good time doing it. Uh, profitable? I'm not sure. Having a good time doing it? Definitely. Yeah. When I so what's your next tournament in um, Argentina? Well, we start uh, Tortugas October fifth. Oh, so October. the association's yeah. got the first game there at uh, Tortugas Country Club, and I believe it'll be open to the public, which is you know obviously welcome news to everyone who's been in Argentina over the past uh, kind of eighteen months. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, uh, it's always a beautiful season in Argentina. And yep. Ferdinand, uh, I mean, you understand competing at the highest level, it's always, you know, little margins of, of errors or, you know, getting it right. It's the difference. And so, you know, this, when the pressure is on, I think, you know, as sportsmen and, and sports, you know, women, it's, uh, it's attractive to be in that spot because you want to, you know, push your boundaries and see where your limits are. Great. Right. And then you were playing in Halonga, aren't you? And then finally to the Argentine Open. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. And you're invited. Come, come and be with us. If you haven't selected your favorite team for the uh, Triple Crown, come be with Allegria. We'd be happy to take you on right. and, and put you in the in the hat and the jersey and be with us in the tent. Great. Thanks. <laughs> are you are you going to have an auction, host auction this year or not? Yeah, so one of the interesting things that we do when we're breeding 60 horses a year is that before we put the saddle on them, we have a horse auction and we sell horses based on their bloodlines. So the maternal and the, and the paternal bloodlines create whatever baby is being sold for auction. And it's based on those bloodlines and confirmation. And it's been a very successful way to distribute uh, bloodlines throughout the world because the buyers are coming from like Malaysia, Nigeria, Spain, England, France, America all over the place and uh you know because it takes five years to train them often you know five years from that purchase date they show up uh wherever we're playing and because polo is a very internationally played sport um you know i get people writing me from like england for example this summer there was a few horses that we sold through the auction that were performing well and uh you know it's a real pleasure to see that because that's the whole idea we want to breed uh horses that can play at the highest level and people are enjoying them great great Richard, any message? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, this is all great. Uh, absolutely awesome. Fantastic. Uh, there's all these examples that everybody here has provided, which are, are actually examples of market environmentalism. That's, that's the approach we take with our firm in terms of investment philosophy and approach. And uh, just to give you a bit of insight on what I mean, uh, so it's it's a, an approach to environmentalism call call market environmentalism, and there are um, essentially four principles of that. I can share this on my screen uh, if you can see this. So yeah, everybody here has has provided those type of examples, like uh, Princess Theodora on the de decentralization aspects in terms of very local solutions all over the world that that the green team team is involved with uh, so that that's an example there um, certainly all of the optimism and innovation uh, that Ferdinand and and Fred have related on the, the work that they do um, the idea is applying technology or solutions like the carbon credits system um, all together to reduce uh, carbon emissions and to have a meaningful impact on the environment. So this, this is the approach of market environmentalism. So it's very different from uh, agenda-based environmentalism, which many are, are looking at uh, these days in terms of initiatives that are happening around the world, um, because it's more of a people-based approach uh, we follow the Austrian School of Economics, which emphasizes people. So the idea that uh, you, you cannot change human nature, uh, you, you know, you want to develop systems and, and technologies that are aligned with human nature. Uh, the whole idea in sustainability of sports, making 
making people happy, uh, making people uh, work together uh, for uh, competing together in, in the sports. Uh, it's, it's all about people and, and happiness and, and, and the human condition. Uh, and this is something that just cannot be changed or, or forced to change through any uh, type of authoritarian or, or surveillance monitoring or whatever. Uh, so the, the best way is to apply, you know, technology type solutions, innovation, optimism, all of these elements here that, that are mentioned uh, through, through market environmentalism. Great. Great. Thanks. I, can I say something about that? I, I really, I really like that idea because I feel like anybody that would to be forced to be sustainable or forced to make a donation or forced to, to, to become greener, it's going to be completely short term. Like nobody will do something through their own will after being forced to do it. So mm -hmm, the, right. the goal is always right. to make, I, like, I love That's the word, so like, to make it yeah. as sexy as possible. So yeah. you want to go and do it out of your own being because you will take yeah. that home. You will do it tomorrow. You'll do it next year. You'll do it the year after. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like in yeah. sports, like they said, like, why don't you take your dry fast, snack fast to the organization? And you just say you increase the uh, annual uh, entrance fee by three and a half thousand euros, which is uh, the base portfolio. And then every team has to pay that and then they get to offset. And then you have a whole offset race. And like, well, you can do that. First of all, you can have angry people because they don't want to spend yeah. more money. Two, <laughs> yeah. And they're going to mean nothing within the garages, which is actually my main target. And three, it's just not going to happen the year after if they don't want to do it themselves, you know, so. It has to be cool. It has to be, yeah. you have to get young drivers to want to be a part of it. You have to get them to post on their social media, be like, Drive Fast, Act Fast is wicked. My team's joined just now. Uh, super proud to be part of it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we've won this, we've won that. And then that, that was that was cool for me. I think what you said was, it needs to be something cool, something modern, yeah. something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we are running up the time. Anything else you want to add, Fred? No, I've Fred? had a great time with everyone. I think uh, it's been a pleasure meeting everyone. Um, Alejandro, you're a wizard, always putting these things together. And thanks a lot for thinking of me and including me. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how everyone develops on their initiatives and know the gates of Allegria are open to all. Ah, thank you. I'll see you in Buenos Aires for sure, Fred. Perfecto. Yeah. And Flora, anything else you want to um, say? No, All thank right. You. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure being able to talk to both Fred and Ferdinand. And um, I hope that we'll all stay in contact and maybe we can all do some things together because that would be epic. And yeah, it was lovely hearing all of your contributions to this conversation and all the different aspects and point of views on the same issue. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And we sure could keep in touch and keep on working on sustainability and green life. Uh, Ferdinand, anything else to you want to add to finish? No, no, not after what Theodore and Fred said. They, that's way too intelligent. I can't top that. So I just say thanks as well. And uh, and uh, appreciate it and um yeah it's been nice been nice to share and 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 learn and um be reminded that i need to invest in bitcoin clearly that's something that uh, or in fred's version of it which is probably far healthier for all it, of us easy to find just go on google and type in carbon negative bitcoin lots of information on it sweet thank you i will guys everyone it's been a pleasure hope everyone has a super rest of your day you too. Yes. Well, I'm going to sleep now, huh? I'm in Austria. <laughs> I hopefully, I hopefully, I will see you in Vienna. But I, I, should, I have to go to Vienna in November for a. I have to give a lecture in a economic a congress on, on economics and Austrian economics. So I should be in Vienna by the beginning of November. Fantastic. Hopefully, It'll be lovely. Yeah. Okay. Now, Richard, I think to. Last words to close this great fun. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been absolutely fantastic. Your, your thoughts, your insights, and the solutions that you come to the table with, what, what you're doing is just absolutely great. Um, and, and a model, uh, exemplary model to, to everybody, to, to the industry. 
and let's continue this work all, all together. We'd, we'd greatly appreciate that. That uh, So th thank you so much uh, for the participation and your thoughts are Princess Theodora, Ferdinand, and Fred, and Alvaro, who was here earlier. Thank you. And Alejandro. Okay. Thank you, all of you. Bye-bye now, and see you soon, hopefully. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.